Love, as Shakespeare said, is only one of many passions. Woolly bit of a bully. <laughs> Nonconformists <laughs> apply here. Oh, father, isn't he lovely? Girls! There you are, Niles. Women. Just kill me now. <laughs> Women. confused here. Fridays from 9.30 on 4. Hi. Still there? Great. Look, Cherie just stuck her head in and said, you know, if you fancy popping around, we're having a small do. You're all very welcome. I mean, you know, obviously, if you want to stay and watch Rory Bremner, well, yeah, that's great. You know, we'd love you to do that, too. But we'd love you not to, as well, if that's what you want. On the 1st of May, 1997, a new star was formed in the firmament of British public life. Today, Royal Mail, in conjunction with the trustees of the Tony Blair Fund, proudly announced the issue of a new set of stamps dedicated to the man who, in his brief time in office, touched all our lives, bringing light and compassion into the gloom and despair of our everyday existence. From today, the public will also be invited to contribute to the fund through the purchase of Tony Blair sketch cards, Tony Blair coins, Tony Blair commemorative plates and mugs. From this week, the public in their millions will also be able to buy special commemorative tubs of margarine bearing the Tony signature, with profits going to two of the charities most closely associated with his work, Formula One and News International. <laughs> Tickets will shortly go on sale for a concert to celebrate the life and work of the People's Prime Minister, featuring Mick Hucknall and any other pop star who hasn't gone back on what they said when Labour got in. I think the lasting memory will be uh, of a man who transformed British politics. <laughs> One only has to think of about a year ago, we had a government which was riven with internal divisions, uncertain of the, the, the European single currency, and increasingly caught up in allegations of sleaze and impropriety. Whereas now... <laughs> it is to be a government of high ideals and hard choices. Not popular for one time, but remembered for all time. Not just a better government than the Tories, but one of the great radical reforming governments of British history. Look, you know, uh, I, I have a dream. <laughs> ask, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask for a cafe latte. <laughs> uh, and indeed, you know, why not visit our new club shop in Downing Street, you know, offering a, a wide range of souvenir memorabilia, internet services, gritty television dramas, and complimentary children's fun pack. <laughs> you know, why, why not hold your children's party in the House of Commons? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> So here we are, one year in, and already there's a sort of fashionable view that the new Labour government's all style and no content. Well, you know, you could argue it the other way around, listening to the commentators. <laughs> well, there was devolution in Scotland, out to Wales, an independent Bank of England, a shilly-shally with education, bringing the social chapter back into play from touch, runaway road roller of welfare reform, a wee bit of argy-bargy over the Constitution, and we'll be dancing in the streets of the Garvaki Road tonight, I tell you. <laughs> If anything, if anything, the one thing they have cocked up on is style. And so it is, it's one of those ironies that a government so obsessed with its image in the press finds the press beginning to turn against it. I mean, Tony Blair, he must wonder in the mornings, he must wonder why in Britain we elect a government and then complain and whinge about it. But that's the whole point. This is Britain. In Britain, we elect a government so we can complain about it. That's what we do, we're brilliant at it. It's the only thing we're still good at. You know, we're like kids with a new toy, you know. Oh, there you are, you've been going, you've been banging on about it for ages. Please, mummy, please, mummy, I have a Labour government. And oh dear, oh God, it's my birthday, I haven't had a Labour government for 18 years. Oh, that one is fun to call it, I want to get rid of it. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Look. 
want to go to Labour government, I want a touchy feeler, user friendly, cleaner, wired up, street wise, envy of all my friends, Labour government, I'll be really good, I'll play me taxes, please, 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 I'll eat me dinner, please give me a Labour government. So eventually, <laughs> mum and dad give in, and they say, OK, you can have it. And what happens? They give you a brand new government, you play with it for a while, and then the batteries run out and you lose the instructions, and it starts coming to pieces, and then novelty wears off. And after a few months, you think, I've had enough of this, so I want to break it all up and go out and blow me pocket money on some bald farty who looks like Chucky. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, Tony Blair, he's, he has been trying, you know, getting on with things. Yeah turning Britain into a show home. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I want a government that does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> yes, uh, clearly, of course, there have been the mistakes, notably Geoffrey Robinson, Lord Irvin and Robin Cook, the three disgraces. <laughs> Although, to be fair, Robin Cook is aware he's made a complete ass of the job so far, and this weekend he's hoping to make up for it. He'll be representing Britain at the funeral of Pol Pot. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Cook, what are you going to do about the rumblings in the Balkans? <laughs> I thought colonic irrigation job. <laughs> and then last week, Good Friday, nearly Labour's first anniversary, we get the peace settlement from Ireland. And by any standards, you know, that, that's a great achievement. And so the Prime Minister issued a statement today saying, this peace settlement isn't for me, it's for everyone. He said he'd like to thank all those who made it possible. John Major and Albert Reynolds for all their hard work at the start of the process. Mo Mo. <laughs> Jerry Adams and David Trimble for having the courage to negotiate. And Ian Paisley for keeping out of it. <laughs> but even then, there was this element of new labour about it. You know, Tony Blair arrived in Belfast and he said, well, you know, look, no, no sound bites. No, no sound bites, but, you know, I, I feel... You know, the hand of history. Uh, <laughs> capital H. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what we can do. You know, I, I don't know if it'll work. It, it might not happen at all, but at, at least by being here, you know, we're, we're trying. And if something, or, you know, anything really, comes out of all this, then, you know, it, it'll be worth the effort. <laughs> and isn't that what New Labour's all about? <laughs> What happened to the bus? <laughs> I married her. <laughs> Prime Minister, one year in power, wallpaper, Robin Cook, uh, Bernie Eccleston. Is that as bad as it gets? Oh, yeah, hey, John. <laughs> yeah, hold on. It's just, you know, step back from this a little bit. I mean, we've only been in power for, what, 12 months? You know, that's, what, 365 days? You know, 8,760 minutes? 505,600 whatever it is. But time enough for you to do a good number of U-turns and, 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 and retreats. Well, John, you know, what I would say unto you is, you know, I'm in the business of government. <laughs> and in any business, you know, you, you produce a product, in, in our case, the government, and that product comes with certain guarantees. Now, in your first year, I mean, it's standard practice that, you know, if something's under guarantee, you change it. I mean, look, we had the, you know, the fox hunting. You know, we said we'd approve the bill, you know, give it an easy passage. People said they didn't like that. We took it back and we changed it. You know, we said we'd tax peps and tessas, and they said, well, you know, hang on, <laughs> they're not quite sure. So we took it back and we changed it. And then there was you know, the ban on tobacco advertising, and Bernie Eccleston said, well, you know, hang on, Tony. Uh, and you know, so we took that back and changed it. In fact, we, we even gave him a refund. You know, so, you know, that's, the policy of a guarantee is working. And next year, it's standard practice, you know, if they want that guarantee to extend, they will have to pay a premium. And, <laughs> how about Indonesia? Your manifesto suggested that you would not, in fact, go on sending armaments to a dictatorial regime. Oh, well, you know, John, I mean, I think in business you can't discriminate between one customer and another. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know I want you know, 10 cruise missiles and, and a hawk. You know, you don't, you don't sort of, you, know, you don't say, well, who are you? You say, well, I'm great, I'm the order. Some people say Ireland was one of the tough choices, but there's a whole raft of tough choices. Welfare reform. What are you doing about that? Well, John, you know, I mean, that's not really a question for me. I mean, welfare reform, you know, you should ask Frank Field and Harriet Harman. I mean, that's, you know, that's their role. Minimum wage? Well, again, you know, minimum wage. <laughs> I'm talking. I mean, you know, that's, that's not my responsibility. Voting reform? Well, John, you know, we keep harping back to this, but voting reform, I mean, we've appointed already a committee to look into voting reform and the whole policy area. And Roy Jenkins is heading that up. Um, you know, they will report sometime in, in the next millennium. All right. Um, <laughs> well, 
like, John, you know, <laughs> there we have the TUC and we have the CBI and they will get together and they will thrash out some sort of agreement and, and that's how it should be. I mean, you know, uh, my job is to be Prime Minister. But there's not a single <laughs> tough choice taken, Prime Minister. Well, John, I take tough choices every day. I mean, you know, I had a choice whether I came and talked to you or not. I took that choice. <laughs> I said I wouldn't. Alice has said, of course you will, and so I'm here. <laughs> but, you know, that's an example of, of how it works. But I think it's important in government to get government away from the hands of, you know, the few in Whitehall and out towards the people. This is the people's government. And but I I, think, I've pressed you on pensions, yeah. on minimum wage, well, on Europe, well, on the, trade union the, rights. Area Every that, single one of them, you say you've got a body looking at what's going to happen. Well, now, what happens if they come back and you disagree with what they come up with? Well, you know, the, you know we'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. I mean, you know, <laughs> I won't be here. I'll be Gordon Brown. I'll have to deal with that one because, you know, I, you know I'm out of here. But I think <laughs> the important thing about this is that, you know, people need a prime minister who understands the people and relates to what they do. Now, I don't know how many people you know that live in Downing Street and, and <laughs> drive around in government cars and, and do this. And, you know, that has no meaning to the people in the street. And I think it's very important that I am ordinary, that I do the school run, that I you know, go shopping, usually, <laughs> that I stay close to the people. I mean, you know, Forgive what me, they really minister. want is a prime minister who can get to the top level of... of, uh, of, of uh, Chuck Bandicoot. Prime Minister, <laughs> what's the best thing about being in Downing Street, being Prime Minister? Well, you know, there's the paintings, <laughs> the furnishings, and, and I think just, you know, the, the sense that you can wake up every morning and go, yeah, I'm Prime Minister. <laughs> what toll has it taken on you, Prime Minister? Well, you know, I think I've, the travel. Obviously, I mean, I had to travel to meet President Clinton, and uh, you know, it, to, to meet to see that great man close up was, I think, one of the great achievements, one of the great exciting moments for me for a, for a Labour Prime Minister to see a Democratic president. Despite all the accusations surrounding well, Monica think, Lewinsky, well, I think you know, I think there's a lot that I can learn from <laughs> a number of positions that he explained to me. But you know, we all, as a government, have to cooperate together if we're going to make the world. A better place, and I, I think it was Nye Bevan who said, you know, reach up and touch, <laughs> make this world a better place if you can. <laughs> then, you know, that's politics. Prime Minister, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. Mr. Secretary Dobson. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, turned out nice again, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh, uh, cheerio. Uh, right, and now, now listen, what did all the little work you did today? Because there's been something on my mind. I'll, I'll be honest with you, the health service is in a right-out mess. No, really, I'm serious. <laughs> you haven't been around it recently, have you? Well, I have, and morale's terrible. You should hear the things they're saying. Oh, terrible, yes, Mrs. Yes. Oh, oh, goodbye. Uh, anyway, you, you know that extra money that we promised, you know, last year, the big fanfare? Well, it's only for one year. Yes, it's, it's true, I'm, I'm the health secretary. I, I know all, all these sorts of things. And, and anyway, you, you know we promised to end the Tories' internal market in health care? Well, well, we've really just renamed it. Yeah, a quarter of nurses are due to retire within two years, prescription charges are up, and we reprieve one threatened hospital only to announce closure of another. And, well, and look, I, I've not said this before, but to be quite honest with you all, it, it's beginning to get me down. <laughs> I mean, you know, lively, dashing, happy, gay, springing my step. But now look at me. Excuse me. I, I, I know I, I should have said something sooner, but you don't like to, do you? It's not bad news. Nobody likes bad news. I'm a nice man. Everybody says so. And I don't like going around upsetting people. But, but uh, uh, people can be not very nice to you sometimes, you know, in the lobby. Mm. <laughs> if you don't paint a rosy glow, it's, look, what are you looking so glum about, Frank? I hope you're not going to give the game away by blabbing, old timer. <laughs> anyway, I feel a lot better now, uh, as I told you, and I've got it all off my chest. Now, uh, any questions? Quickly, because the coach is about to leave. All right. Now, many of you watching tonight, safe at home with your loved ones, probably aren't aware just how frail and temporary life can be. One little slip, one foolish comment that's off message and sends the party media control unit into a spin, 
and things can get me. <laughs> Aren't they, David? <laughs> David who, you ask? Well, my point precisely. David Clark. You see, there he is, there he is, a picture from our files. He's a nice chap, good minister, lovely wife, lovely daughter, and they need a father. <laughs> and what happens is momentarily, without thinking, he says something that upsets the government. Well, you see, friends, family, offspring, oh, lost forever. <laughs> Knock on the door in the middle of the night, daddy's been taken away, and if you ever mention his name again, you'll never see your mummy again either. <laughs> so there we are, David. You know who you are. And we certainly do. <laughs> so mind how you go, and uh, don't tell anyone we've had this little chat, David, because you know what happened to Frank Dobson. <laughs> uh, sorry, apparently that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to New Britain. Now under a forward-looking new government, it's been fully relaunched and renovated with a new, lighter feel and a whole range of facilities for the leisure and fashion conscious. At the heart of London, the capital of cool, the tired old traditions of state are being swept away, replaced by a more modern and relevant approach with the emphasis on style. The House of Lords, once little more than a talking shop, now given a timely makeover to become SW1, London's latest destination restaurant with design by Terence Conran and food by Marco Pierre White. <laughs> Democracy is coming home, coming closer to the people than ever before, with regional assemblies planned for Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, Reading, Swindon, Bath, Bristol Temple Meads and Bristol Parkway. In the cities and towns of New Britain, new buildings are springing up as Britain faces the future with more relevance. Take the Bank of England and the Treasury, separate them and no longer do you have decisions about Britain's economy made in smoke-filled rooms behind closed doors in Whitehall and the city. Instead, they're made here in the air-conditioned comfort of Brussels and Bonn. <laughs> On arrival, you'll be met by one of our ambassadors, each specially chosen to reflect the very best of modern Britain. Come to the cool, new hip-hop happening Britain. It's where it's at. A country that knows where it's going and knows a good restaurant when it gets there. And don't forget, for frequent visitors, we give Blair Miles. Now, the funny thing is, the more you look at Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, the more they're like that couple in the Prudential ad, you know? I want to be able to have a meaningful relationship <laughs> with the unions and the TUC. Well, bugger the unions, I want to get on with the CBI. <laughs> I want to get on with plans for the European single currency. I want to get on with Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want the middle classes to like me. I want a tax child benefit, scrap my ass and raise inheritance tax. <laughs> well, I want the rich to like me too. I want to sting the rich with a 50% top rate income tax. <laughs> I want to see Peter Mandelson working in cabinet. I want to see Peter Mandelson working in habitat. <laughs> in the morning and Gordon Brown is already hard at work. The Chancellor is very conscious of figures and keeps in trim with a daily workout. Today he is working out how to cut public sector borrowing by 2%. 5.45. Not for nothing is he called the Iron Chancellor. As well as doing all his own collars and cuffs, he regularly takes in laundry from the rest of the cabinet to help make hands meet. I will. It's one pound eighty for a shirt, one pound twenty for a neckerchief, grease, stubborn stains, and Prescott pants extra. You see, it's not just the government's backside cover; it's their arses as well. Six thirty a.m. The Chancellor's first meeting of the day. Uh, right, gentlemen. Uh, before we move on to the business of fiscal policy, I'd like to turn to the more pressing matter of who's up to date with their tea money. <laughs> Well, I think we've had a very frugal and prudent meeting. For the health service, we've agreed an extra 23p phased in over three years. 
Uh, new bios for senior management, as and when cash flow permits. You're five feet short there, Archie. And uh, we've approved money for a one-off benefit increase for single one-parent families, where the child is over the age of 95 and still lives at home. It's now 8.30. The Chancellor has been at work for five hours. Meanwhile, next door, the Prime Minister has just woken and is trying to get to grips with the main issue of the day. Sheree, darling. How do we get the kids' to work? 7.30. Gordon Brown arrives in the city for another keynote speech. He has now been at work for 15 hours, has chaired 12 meetings, written six briefing papers, and repainted the whole of the spare bedroom, two coats with a rub-down in between. And I will publish the findings in the new year. And finally... May I just compliment the staff here tonight for the standards in the washroom, which have been excellent, especially with the provision of soap. Hand Gordon is back, hard at work in his office. Dear Harriet Harmon, no. Really, an envelope for that. Emergency supplies of school kids. In case a photo opportunity arises. Go to a nice caring family man, you know, instead of that hard-nosed, steely chancellor image. Bye-bye. <laughs> 11.45, and Gordon is back at work in his study. He still has a few more hours' paperwork to complete before bedtime. Bugger! It's another expenditure I hadn't accounted for. Well, I think, you know, naturally, uh, you know, one does reflect from time to time on the work and life and, and the bigger picture and think, you know, is it worth all the stress and the, and the grind and the workload? Uh, you soon could have, a, could have a coffee. And then, you know, something Thank clicks, you. a light, a beacon, something that, that resolutely says, yes, Gordon, yes, you must, you must carry on. But mainly, I think it's a thought that that bastard next door stole the job I wanted. It's now 1.30 in the morning, and Gordon has finally gone to bed. In two hours' time, he'll be up again for another packed day. Oh, well, celebrate? Celebrate what? Uh, George Ploy, you are a senior advisor at 10 Downing Street. Yes, I am, yes. Aren't you a bit old to be an advisor to New Labour? <laughs> Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm very much younger than I look. I'm, I'm, I'm just 29. 29? Is that dog years? <laughs> no, it isn't. It's just the, the stress of the job makes oh, me I... look like this. See. Well, if people believe that, they'll believe anything. <laughs> yes, that's rather the principle we operate on. <laughs> New Labour's been in power for, for a year oh. now. How, how do you think you've been doing? Well, really, really well, yeah, uh, well. on the whole, I think. I mean, we've made mistakes. Yeah, what, what would you say is the biggest mistake you've made? <laughs> this is completely outrageous. <laughs> Sorry? When I, mean, I came here to talk about the government's record and all you're interested in and the negative things. Well, I, I, I mean, I didn't intend... Sorry to that isn't what people want, you know. Not ordinary, decent, real people. They don't want that. <laughs> they want hope and something to believe in. You want to destroy all that. No, I don't. There you are, you see another negative. <laughs> now, I remember, I remember a year ago, seeing a little nine-year-old boy standing in Downing Street when Tony arrived, waving his flag, his eyes gleaming with hope and tears of joy. Now, that little boy was real. Yes. We know that because we chose him. <laughs> after extensive marketing research. We gave him his flag and we taught him to wave it. Now, you want to take away all that joy and all that hope. Well, no, I don't, actually. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, one day, perhaps you'll find that little boy lying in a gutter, clutching a hypodermic needle. All his hopes gone, believing in nothing, trusting in nothing, his dreams all shattered. And then I suppose you'll be happy. <laughs> well, all I said was, what was the biggest mistake that you think you made? <laughs> Who said we've made any mistakes? You did. Well, that was very decent of me, wasn't it? 
a lot of politicians wouldn't do that, you know. A lot of politicians would come here and say how wonderful they are, but we're not like that. And it takes someone who is genuinely and sincerely wonderful to say they've made mistakes. <laughs> and what do I get for being wonderful? I just have these mistakes sort of groveled up and thrown in my face. Well, look, it was a perfectly straightforward question. Yes, but ordinary, real people don't want those sorts of questions. <laughs> well, what sort do they want? What do you mean, what sort do they want? We sent you a list of questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, I just thought it would be more interesting if I asked my own questions, that's all. Well, I mean, that's just the sort of arrogance, isn't it? <laughs> Typical of you so-called media people, I'm afraid. You know, frankly, there's no place for you in the self-confident Britain that Tony is trying to create. Well, I suppose you could say that, that Tony Blair sort of has to make mistakes occasionally just to prove he's human. <laughs> Do you know, that's one we've never thought of. Can I say that that's the most extraordinary perceptive remark? I mean, what a, what a pleasure it is to talk to someone who understands what we're trying to do. Yes, and, and if Tony Blair, I mean, did make deliberate mistakes to prove he's human, that would explain some of the policies that you've brought in about which people have said, you know, they never expected the Labour government to do that. This is brilliant! <laughs> <laughs> Just sort of carry on. Well, I mean, the, 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 the obvious example, I suppose, is, is cutting uh, benefits to the disabled. No, we did that to save money. No, 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 no but I'm, try, I'm trying to help you here. I mean, oh, if, if, if you'd said instead that it was a deliberate mistake, you know, by Tony Blair, wouldn't that have been better for you to... to well, well, I mean, what's wrong with the policy? Well, people, you know, have felt that you were picking on the most defenceless, the least powerful people. Well, they're the best people to pick on, aren't they? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the, the, the problem here. I mean, in any case, we're, we're not cutting benefits to the disabled now. Uh, you're not? No, we're just spending less money on them. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't quite follow that. Yeah, um... uh, it's, it's, it's something called the Benefit Integrity Project. Yes, what, what, what is that? It... Well, it, it works by getting hold of people who think they're disabled. Yes. <laughs> and telling them that they're not. <laughs> oh, it's, it's wonderful news. Yes, and quite a surprise to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, almost sort of miraculous. Yes, <laughs> yes, I yes. see. And what, what sort of uh, diagnosis, what, how do you can, can you tell, you know, that some people... Well, the main sign that they're not disabled is that they're not getting any benefit. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the main that's thing. how you recognise. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and this, of course, encourages them to, to get into work, because yeah. obviously when they're in work, uh, they don't need the benefit. No, and if they're in a job, of course, they, it makes them feel better doesn't it, about themselves? Yes, so. unless the job brings on sort of terrible agonising pains. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. But we want, you see, we want them to forget that they are disabled. Yes. And obviously they, they can't do that if we keep giving them money simply because they are disabled. They are disabled. <laughs> you see, it just yes, sort of rubs yes. it in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, we have a whole raft of options for the disabled. For, for, what, what are the, some of the ideas you've got? Well, there are lots of ideas. Yes. I mean, for example, uh, we could send them down the mines. <laughs> there aren't many jobs down the mines, though, are they, <laughs> these days? No. No, and, and, and even if they were, it's not the ideal work for people who are disabled, is it? No, I didn't say send them down the mines to work. <laughs> I mean, we're not entirely heartless. Yeah. You know, just send them down the mines. <laughs> and then at least they'd be out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. Uh, <laughs> I must say, this is beginning to sound worse than the Conservatives. Well, that's very nice of you to say that. <laughs> very much. You wouldn't deny, would you, that, that there are some people in the country who do actually really need uh, benefits, some disabled benefits? No, I wouldn't deny that. No. Not, not for a moment. No. no. And, and we have made a pledge. Yes. And not just a pledge. No. A, a solemn pledge. Oh, it's one of your best pledges, isn't it? The solemn one of our best pledges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That no one who genuinely needs support will be denied it. So it's a question of targeting. It's a question really. of targeting. Yes. And we've, we've instituted a very, very rigorous programme of, of targeting. And how's it coming along? Terribly well. Is it? <laughs> yes. yes, we've already identified, you know, that section of the community that we think will qualify uh, for benefit. Uh, could you give me some rough idea who, who they are? Well, I can do better than that. I can, I can be precise. 
uh, they are a Mr. and Mrs. Higgins <laughs> who live in Runcorp. I see. And, and what is it about Mr. and Mrs. Higgins that qualifies them for? Well, investigations aren't complete yet, but a preliminary assessment would suggest that they don't have any arms or legs, <coughs> and they can neither speak or hear or see. Yeah. Well, that would suggest, on the face of it, that they are a deserving case. Uh, you know. On the face of it? Yes. <laughs> but we have to be very careful here, you know, I mean, we are, we are dealing with taxpayers' money. Yes, yes you know. of course. So, at the moment, they are under intense surveillance by MI5. Yeah. <laughs> and if, uh, after a year, uh, there is no evidence of fraud on mm. their part, then they may well qualify for a handout. But yes. you see, we have to be absolutely convinced mm. that they are incapable of, of work. Yes. yes. Uh, although it would be hard if they've got no arms or legs or can speak or see or hear. I mean, it's hard to imagine what sort of work they could do. Hard, but not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just off the top of my head, uh, you know, they could, um, they could blow up balloons. <laughs> And with the, uh, with the millennium approaching, we're going to need thousands of them. Yes, yes. I, I see. But failing that, they will get, uh, failing, failing that, the balloon will, option, yes, they, they will get... Yes, um, yes. Uh, uh, and actually, as, I, as I've just spoken of the millennium, um, mm. I mean, I think it will be very important for Mr. and Mrs. Higgins mm. to contribute to the millennium. In what, in what way? How could they do that? Well, you know, we could exhibit them in, in the day. <laughs> as a symbol of your generosity and compassion. Yes. I yeah. mean, you know, as a contribution to this great beacon of hope. Mm. I mean, it would demonstrate their, their role in society. They could have a sort of label round their necks. Say, uh, saying what? I don't know, saying something like, not working. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, that would symbolise their value. Yeah, of course, there'll probably be a lot of other things inside the dome with labels on saying, not working. <laughs> um. <laughs> I must say that's a very negative attitude. Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, we, we've got used to that in the last year, you know. Mm. What, yes. Yes. Criticism. Yes, yes, absolutely. But this government doesn't mind that. It's going to go ahead anyway and do just what it thinks is right. Whatever criticism people have against it. Yes. Absolutely. We will not mm. be deflected in any way at all. We will do exactly what we think is right. Yes. I see. It could be said, of course, that New Labour is too sensitive to criticism. The most horrible thing I've ever heard anyone say. <laughs> well, really on, upset now. So, but on reflection, there is some truth in that, isn't there? No, I don't think there's any truth at all. It's absolutely unfair. I mean, after all we've done, well, we work very hard. Yes, you know, and we say our prayers every night. <laughs> and we have people saying terrible things about you. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Sorry. I thought you were on our side. Well, I'm, I'm not on anybody's side. Well, there you are, you see. You've come out with it. Well, I'm not going to sit here and be insulted. No, I, I, it's just my role here is to be neutral. Well, that's it, isn't it? That just means that you hate us. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No. I'm not going to answer any more questions until you say you're sorry. <laughs> well, all right, I'm sorry. It's not good enough. <laughs> what do you want me to say? I want you to say that new labour is completely wonderful and completely incapable of doing anything wrong. Well, I can't say that. I mean, that's stupid. <laughs> No, it isn't. Come on, say it. All right, well, well new labour is completely wonderful and completely incapable of doing anything wrong. You don't mean it? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, you better. Because we're the government, you know. We can do things. Not just nice things. We can do unpleasant things. People that don't like us. What, what sort of things? Just because you work for Channel 4, it doesn't mean to say you're safe, you know. <laughs> You could be privatised. You wouldn't like that. <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't like ending up working for Rupert Murdoch. No, it's not so bad. <laughs> this is a man in a hurry. This is a man who is busy. This is a man who uses Charlie. <laughs> Charlie from the Salon de Wilhelm. Charlie keeps you smelling fresh all day long, whatever the other lot say. When he looks this great, he must be using Charlie. Charlie, for that first whiff of trouble.
Yes, and the next one, please. <laughs> Oh, no, oh, it's you. Uh, don't switch off. This should be a bit of a laugh. Uh, Mr. Dewar, welcome. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, uh, um, 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 Have to hurry you. Person's name, three syllables, um, first letter J. Um, Jeremy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Dewar. No mucking about. When are you off to Scotland? Uh, well, uh, Jeremy, um, what I would um, say to you uh, in this uh, context is... Um, uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, um, oh, my God. No, take him uh, away. Uh, uh, so, I don't know why we bother. Twenty minutes later, home every evening, so you can't get a word out. Um, abroad now, I'm joined by the American president, Mr. Clinton. Mr. Clinton, hello. Uh, hi there. Uh, I say what a great pleasure it is to be able to appear on your... No, um, first off, you're started for 10, Northern Ireland. Um, will you be travelling to Belfast? Uh, well, sir, I hope so. I know your Prime Minister spoke last week of the hand of history. And if I can touch anybody with my hand, <laughs> then I'm happy to make the trip, sir. Uh, indeed. Now, on to more serious matters. Can you shed any light on all this sexual harassment stuff? Uh, well, sir, the lady concerned has, in fact, no, no, already no, tested... No, no, I mean your sexual encounter with Tony Blair. I beg your pardon, sir? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Can you or can you not confirm reports that the British Prime Minister walked into the Oval Office, asked you to drop your strides, and inserted his tongue into your sweaty Arkansas cleat? Well, there are three answers to that, Mr. Parkman. First, it never happened. Yes, it did. The official White House photographer got it all on film. Yeah, le le let me finish, sir. Let me finish. The second point is, yes... It did happen. <laughs> I think both nations should be proud that the Prime Minister of England is allowed access to such a sensitive piece of the presidential anatomy. Well, it's hardly exclusive, is it? Uh, did you have a third point? The third point is that as far as the people of America are concerned, what two consenting world leaders do in the privacy of their own press briefings is entirely their own business. Ah, uh, yes, but there is a picture emerging here of the British Prime Minister's promiscuity. One thinks of the heavy petting with Bernie Eccleston and his close canoodling with Rupert Murdoch. Oh, uh, well, sir, I don't want to get involved in all and that. And then there was no Gallagher of Oasis. According to reports here, the Prime Minister lured Mr Gallagher into number 10 with promises of a three-page spread in the Daily Mail and then asked him to tie him up and pour a bucket of cold shit over his head. Did you know that? Uh, no, sir, I did not know. Well, you do now. Go away. <laughs> ah, Mr. Cook, um, stay with us, will you? We'll be talking to you uh, later in the programme. For the moment, though, just time for a quick look at the papers. And uh, here we are. Lord Irvin, the Lord Chancellor, has gone for the hand-printed silk at £400 a roll. Uh, Robin Cook's gone for the rare gilt embossed effect at 150 And uh, John Prescott, six rolls from the discount, but it be in two. <laughs> Join us tomorrow. Good night. Ah, hello. Look, sorry to interrupt your viewing pleasure once again. It was all going terribly well, wasn't it? Very good. No, very, very funny. I like a good joke, especially if it's at someone else's expense and involves a lot of unpleasantness. Uh, uh. I would just like a little word with Frank Field, if he's watching. I am Frank. <laughs> mm. You see, you've been a bit silly over the last few months, haven't you, Frank? Oh, very good to have ideas. Very, very good indeed. Tony likes ideas. We all like ideas. But some ideas can be dangerous. Just like crossing the road late at night outside your house in St. Matthew Street, Westminster, can be very, very dangerous. Possibly fatal. So, to help, we've devised a little scheme for you, Frank. If you behave and come up with the ideas that Tony likes, we'll give you a little sign to say, well done. And that sign is you look in the newspaper, and if you see a whole flurry of stories hinting that your boss, Harriet Harman, looks likely to lose out in the summer reshuffle, then you know Tony likes you. Go to all traitors! <laughs> <laughs> right, that's it. Frank knows where he stands, and we know where Frank stands, and where he parks his car every day. <laughs> OK, back to the show. And do remember, when it's finished and the show is over and you all go to bed tonight, I'll still be up, wide awake, and at my desk. Trio. <laughs> about, you know, what's it all about? That's what I'd like to know. There's a lot of talk about women in the new parliament, and that's great. But 12 months on, what have we got? Those dear old Betty Boothroyd sitting there like a Blackpool landlady. Keep the noise down up there. Breakfast stops at 9.13. Who's been smoking? <laughs>
Harriet Harmon's the fall guy for the benefit cuts, and Margaret Beckett, will you never see her? She's like the running woman in the Iron Mask. <laughs> uh, Tony Benn joins me now to discuss the historic parallels of New Labour. Uh, Tony, do you see history repeating itself, first as tragedy and then as Jack Cunningham? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we, we've seen it all before. I mean, in 1964... No, bear me out. I'm, I'm, I'm not a loony. Um, <laughs> in 1964, 64, the Labour Manifesto was New Britain. We were backed by the sun. Harold Wilson was supporting American military policy in Vietnam. Now it's Iraq. The GLC was inaugurated then. Now we're looking to choose a new Lord Mayor for London. And don't, don't stop me, I'm on a roll. Um, <laughs> And after three years, Britain applied to join the EEC, and in the year 2000, we'll be applying to join a single currency. I mean, blimey, how close can you get and still keep your tezzies? <laughs> so, has anything changed? Well, I mean, all you can say is that these days we've got better wallpaper. Uh, but <laughs> but I, think, I think Tony's always acknowledged his debt to the great figures of the 20th century, uh, John Maynard Keynes, J.K. Galbraith, Terence Conran. Uh, <laughs> But look, I, I think, look, let me be just say, I, I think it's the abuse of power that really marks the difference. But there are those who argue, Mr. Hazeltine, that they've not actually done anything yet. Well, there you are. There you are. What greater abuse of power can there be than to have power and do bugger all with it? <laughs> Prime Minister, you've made much of New Britain, but what is it? Well, you know, John, New Britain is, is what you want it to be. I mean, you know, it's not what I want it to be. It's, it's, it's your choice. I mean, what, it's what you would like New Britain to be. But you're the Prime Minister. You're leading this New Britain. You must know what you're leading. Well, John, you know, how do I know, you know, what you want unless you tell me? I mean, you have a sense of what Britain you want, and I, you know, I can, I can make that happen. But you've talked about leadership and tough choices. Well, tell me what you want. Well, you know perfectly well what people want. They want new hospitals, they want decent schools, they want a proper sewage system. I mean, you well, name it. Well, that's fine, you know, and, and, and they can have it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. But well, where's the money come from? You said well, no, no, no new I mean, taxes. Well, no, no, well, well, just a moment. I mean, you know, th that's what they want. I mean, and, and that's what they have, but I mean, I, I don't know how they're going to get it. Who are the Prime Minister? Well, you know, I, ask Gordon Brown. <laughs> Hello again. Last Easter Monday found me queuing at the checkout down at my local aquatic garden centre. I was holding a large water lily I had just acquired. The Nymphaea aviator pring. And it was dripping slightly down my trousers. On impulse I turned to my neighbour in the queue and said, Knock, knock. Who's there? She replied. John, I said. John who? She asked. Have you forgotten so quickly? <laughs> I responded, and we laughed together. <laughs> How could I have forgotten you, she said. We've been standing in this queue for the last ten minutes. <laughs> Seriously, though, it's strange to think that only twelve short months ago, I was caught up in the hurly-burly, the warp and weft of historic events at number ten, with scarcely a moment to myself. Every day we would be woken up by one or other of my cabinet colleagues, bursting into our bedroom. Sometimes Norma would be in the act of disrobing her pyjamas. <laughs> she never minded. She knew full well that as members of a Conservative cabinet, they'd seen a naked woman before. <laughs> so much has happened since then. Sterling is at a record high. The stock market is booming. The feel-good factor has returned. Saddam Hussein has been humiliated. And most important of all, an historic peace agreement has been concluded in Northern Ireland. These things didn't just come about by accident. <laughs> Obviously they didn't. And I believe that the time has come for credit to be given where credit is due. <laughs> Naturally, I don't expect people to shower me with rose petals wherever I go. But frankly, some demonstration of the nation's gratitude would be welcome. <laughs> A spot of major mania wouldn't come amiss. <laughs> Votive statues of me in every city, town, village and hamlet across the land. My memoirs on every bedside table. Because, frankly, without me and my government's policies, you could find yourselves living now under a Labour government. <laughs> and that would have been a disaster, wouldn't it? <laughs> Good night. <laughs> yeah, leave them wanting more. 
First rule of disability benefits. <laughs> when I was a Conservative, I thought that if I could pass the exams and become a solicitor, I'd like to be a solicitor in the city of Wells in Somerset. And at lunchtime, join Nigel, my estate agent friend, for a half of bitter in the Black Lion, while my wife arranged chrysanthemums on the high altar of the cathedral <laughs> up the road. Now I've joined New Labour, I think I'd like to be a government press liaison officer <laughs> and work in Soho. <laughs> Sitting in Terence Conran's Mezzo restaurant, sipping Malvern water, flattering a lobby correspondent, while my wife shops for ironic 50s-style panties <laughs> at agent provocateur across the way. <laughs> of course, I'm neither of these things, just a 58-year-old man, a spiteful man, an unattractive man, <laughs> who thinks there's something wrong with his liver. <laughs> but why am I so nostalgic for the old lies? Why is that? Is it my age? Or just the retro thing? I wouldn't say Margaret Beckett was ugly. Last time I took her out, she found truffles. <laughs> oh, and what, is, what is this stuff with, with Robin Cook? I mean, as, it, as it was, he had these photos done at Chevening, saying, I have a very happy and fulfilled personal life. I look forward to sharing it with the woman I love. But who does he think he is, Edward VIII? <laughs> we asked Andrew Marr, the editor of The Independent, to interview the Foreign Secretary. <laughs> Foreign Secretary, could we perhaps start by looking at the whole question of Andrew, our relationship? Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. I have said he's very rude of you not at least to acknowledge the presence in this room of a lady. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, dear. Thank you. Staying then on the personal note, Foreign Secretary, does it concern you at all that your first year in office has seen you distance yourself from almost every radical position you took in the past? Uh, you once spoke in favour of a Britain not aligned to a major power, now closely you're allied to America. You were formerly and famously Eurosceptic. Now you find yourself at the heart of Europe and you've even trimmed your beard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I think... Let me put it this way. It's perfectly understandable that in office one has to get rid of some of the shall I say, excess baggage that one carries around whilst in opposition. Radicalism, socialism, the wife. <laughs> but that's politics, isn't it, darling? Could we perhaps return to the question of your incident strewn first year in office? It seems that at various times you or the Prime Minister have managed to alienate or upset the governments of India, Pakistan, Israel, France, Germany and Montserrat. Andrew, let's be quite clear. You yourself have just said we've only held office for a year, 12 brief months. I think there's only so much we can do. <laughs> Finally, can I ask you whether the intense criticism you've received ever gets you down? I can't pretend that it's always easy. And I have to say there are always people out there who will take any chance to do you down. We're talking about Michael Howard and the Conservative front bench. No, I was referring to Gordon Brown. <laughs> Describe for us your feelings about Gordon Brown. Well, Gordon Brown is a man of immense ability, a very great talent and much industry, and I'm very proud to serve alongside him in the cabinet of Tony Blair. And what do you really think? Well, he's a wanker. <laughs> yeah. Order! Order! Yeah. Prime Minister! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, unaccustomed as I am to speaking in this chamber, <laughs> I... Uh, I had intended today to make an important announcement uh, in the usual way. And then I thought, well, you know, why not be different? Yeah, go with it. Why not come here instead? <laughs> well, you know, I only live up the road, on my way to Sainsbury's. I thought, well, I'd drop in, pick up the mail, check the messages, talk to you lot. <laughs> but, Madam Speaker, a year ago, I made a covenant with the people of this country. Yeah. And that covenant was this, that they would keep on getting richer and I would make sure that they felt okay about it. <laughs> but I think we need to look at the real needs of the people of this country and address those needs directly. And already, already, Madam Speaker, we've managed to cut waiting lists for new cars. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, last night, while Cherie was upstairs watching Newsnight, 
I called up God and I said, well, uh, you know, let, let's not get bogged down in the biblical small print. Give it to me straight. Either it's okay to go out and buy everything you ever wanted, or it's not. You know, go ahead, shoot. And do you know what he said? <laughs> he said, well, you're the boss now, Tony. What do you think? <laughs> and I said, well, okay, God, look, here's the deal. We stay at the heart of the Christian community, yeah, 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 yeah. but we opt out of the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. Yeah. New labour, new guilt-free consumerism. Yeah. I was trying to think how the Labour Party themselves might actually be celebrating the anniversary, and, and he thought they might have a big telethon thing. You know, right, well, you know, we've been here for exactly one year, and you know, we like your help in how to run the country and you know, what to do next because we're a bit stuck. Uh, so any ideas you've got on welfare, single currency, constitutional reform, you know, we've got people manning the phones and events taking place all over the country. Let's go up to Scotland and join Scottish Secretary Donald Deere. Uh, hello, um, well, uh, we're going great guns up here with uh, um, the pledges coming in from all over the place. And uh, we, we've got a call from Miss Jeannie McEckney, um, who's volunteered to sit all day in a bath of baked beans. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and she says she'd like to give us her single parent benefit. Well, actually, we were going to have it anyway, uh, Jeannie, but uh, thanks uh, all the same. Oh, great. Well, meanwhile, uh, Gordon Brown's out and about, and he's got the crowd going with, with a little game called Setting the Minimum Wage. Oh, that's right. Uh, we're starting off with the recommended figure from the low pay unit. And that's four pounds sixty-one pence. Okay, bosses, what do you think? Higher, higher, <laughs> higher, oh, lower, lower, lower. <laughs> down, down to, down to three pounds ninety. Okay, right, well, three pounds ninety. Unions, what do you think? Higher, 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 higher. Oh, higher, <laughs> higher, yes, oh, higher, higher. Yes. Let the unions have their say. A fair day's work for a fair day's pay. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, and in our Hull studio, we've got John Prescott. Uh, hello, Tony. All right, how's your belly? Off for spots. You okay? <laughs> Whoa, that's <laughs> really... Hey, hey, hey. John, uh, we've had a letter from a lady in Yorkshire who wants you to put a bucket over your head and sing. Well, I mean, frankly, that's typical of the kind of daft thing you get asked to do by people from time to time. And I mean, if they really think I'm going to get involved in that kind of malarkey, then they've got another thing coming. Well, you know, she says she lives in Hull and, and she hopes to vote for you. <laughs> Clang. You're a big toothbrush, I'm a blue toothbrush, have we met somewhere before? Right, well, thanks for sending in all those pledges. And uh, don't forget, we're governing you, governing us, governing you. Bye. <laughs> Well, we seem to have a few moments in hand, so here's the full Monty. I believe in miracles. <laughs> if you came along, you sexy thing. <laughs> I believe in miracles. Where are you from? <laughs> you sexy thing. Ooh. <laughs> There's nothing of that. Well, you know, that's about it for tonight. I'm back tomorrow at 8, when Andrew Rawnsley will suggest we've had trouble adjusting to the realities of power. Oh, you know, come on, give us a chance. That's absurd. Everyone knows we've been power crazy from day one.